And I'm one of the, um, the newest faculty members here at Gavin Herbert Institute. I'm a retina specialist. Uh, I'm moderating this session as well as uh, giving a, uh, the first presentation in the session. And um, so m my employment is uh, half-time research in, in basic science realm and then half-time in clinical care and surgical care of patients with retinal diseases. And so uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is our retinal organoids. I'll describe what those are and what their relevance is in basic science, uh, in tissue replacement therapies, as well as methods uh, to characterize uh, retinal organoids using multi-photon microscopy. The idea here is seeing the invisible. Everything I'm going to show you today is really more of uh, an extended introduction to the two speakers that will come after me, because they are the juggernauts in this field that have made every single thing that I will show you today possible. Um, they have developed these techniques, and they are the true, uh, the true leaders in this. And when I say juggernauts, they truly are juggernauts. But moving on right now with this. So we've seen some cross sections of eyes today. And we see in this, in this uh, depiction here, the orange retina, the most important tissue in the body. And when we take a photograph inside the eye, we can see that important tissue. This is where light's turned into electricity and allows us to perceive every single bit of visual information. And so in this picture, we can see the optic nerve. We can see the blood vessels coming off that nerve. We can see this little change in pigment centrally. That's your central vision. That's where you read and see faces. That's what gives us our high acuity vision. And then, of course, everything else over here is the peripheral retina, the peripheral vision. That's what saves you from being hit by a car. And so uh, if we zoom in and look a little bit more closely at the back of the eye, looking at this retinal tissue that's important for high acuity vision, we can uh, see that there's a lamellar structure to it. And in this depiction here, we have orange being the retina, a foundation of the retina in green, and then the red blood vessels that supply half of the bottom of the retina uh, with oxygen and nutrients and also take away toxins. And so we can zoom in a little bit further. And as you've seen some depictions today already in a number of, of talks, there are technologies that allow us to look at this resolution uh, in patients on a routine basis, pretty much every single patient that comes into the, one of the retina specialists' clinics here uh, at Gavin Herbert has a photograph that looks like this. And so you can see incredible detail. That detail includes not only the optic nerve, which connects the eye back to the brain and sends all the information back to the brain, but also this foveal depression, which is completely normal. That's where light is turned into electricity and we have the high acuity vision. Of course, the vitreous jelly inside the eye and the blood vessels underneath the retina over here as well. And so here's a photograph of a patient who I saw a couple weeks ago. And this is a color fundus photograph. It shows you the, the beautiful anatomy of the inside of the eye that we're looking at routinely. And at first glance, it actually looks pretty darn normal. If you've looked at thousands of these and you start to, to be able to pick up the nuances of what is abnormal. But we use a lot of photography techniques to try and look at normal and abnormal things in ophthalmology. If I take a different type of photograph, this photograph is the retina in a nightclub. Imagine taking a, a black light from a nightclub and shining it on the retina and looking at the glow of the, of the retina, kind of like a yellow t-shirt or a white t-shirt that looks like it's glowing in the nightclub. That's what this picture is. You've seen a couple of these today already uh, in some of the talks that talked about AMD. If you look carefully at this picture, you can see that there may be something that's a little bit out of place down here. And if we zoom in a little bit more, you might even be able to convince yourself that you see something in this color picture over here. But it really is more apparent in the glow-in-the-dark autofluorescence image of the retina. And we can process that image and make it a little bit more apparent in case you can't see it on, on the projection here on the screen. We can then use OCT as well to look at the microanatomy of the retina. And certainly, we've seen photographs where we have cross sections of the retina here going straight through the fovea, showing beautiful vitreous, beautiful retina with a normal foveal contour and the blood vessels underneath the retina and a perfectly normal foundation. But if you change the angle of, of the OCT, you can see there's a huge abnormality here. And that corresponds to exactly what we saw as the abnormal area in the previous pictures. So we use a lot of different imaging tools to try and assess the structure of the retina in clinic. And the key word there is structure. We can get a great deal of information about structure of the retina. But what, what does the retina do? It turns light into electricity. It's a highly metabolic tissue that turns light into electricity so we can perceive the world. And so seeing retinal function is critical. 
Here's an example, it's a very similar picture to what Dr. Schwartz showed us this morning of age-related macular degeneration in its dry but advanced form, where you see classic loss of pigmentation in, this, in the central uh, macula and in the fovea. So basically light cannot be turned into electricity here. And then the glow in the dark, the nightclub view of this shows the same areas of no pigment because what's happening is that there's no cells here that can reflect or glow in the dark. And so people with this uh, type of disease have lost their central vision. They're not blind, they can see things in the periphery, hopefully, but they usually have just lost their central vision. And again, we can compare this to the normal OCT where you see a nice foundation of the retina here. But the foundation of the retina in age-related macular degeneration in its advanced form is completely lost. The cells that line the foundation are completely absent the photoreceptors, which are this bottommost layer, they're supposed to be here, they're still present over here, but the photoreceptors are all gone. There's no light being turned into electricity in this area, or very little at least. So we can take color photographs, and so here's an analogy to what I'm gonna talk about today, and that is we can take color photographs here, in this case we have a, a child's bedroom with some cats on the wall, some balloons in the bed, and a nice white wall in the background. And that's kind of similar to the photograph of the back of the eye where we have geographic atrophy and macular degeneration, loss of pigment in the central vision. We can turn the night lights on and we can see that there's something there that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. We can see a whole galaxy that these, these cats are enjoying looking at on this child's wall. And that's similar to the, to the uh, glow-in-the-dark photographs, the autofluorescent images that we look at in clinic. But then what happens if we actually look at the quality of the light? It's not just blue light. There's information encoded or stored in that blue light. There's, that information can be separated out using mathematical analysis of the light as it glows. And so imagine if the, if the, the, night, light, the, the, the night sky looked like that. And that's what it looks like to the top Hubble telescope. It's got special sensors for looking at information that might be hidden to us. And so this is the next paradigm shift in ophthalmic imaging where we can start to look at uh, some information that might tell us about function of tissues rather than just the structure, looking at the function as well. So in basic science, Anybody who's ever worked in the basic science lab has probably encountered a variety of things that glow in the dark, things that stick to cells, fluorophores, that tell you what specific molecules are present at what specific locations in a tissue sample. This is the full, uh, a, a large selection of these fluorophores that are used for glow-in-the-dark biology, looking at things in, uh, in tissues. And so if we plot on the x-axis here the um, uh, uh, visible spectrum with infrared spectrum on the, on the right and the UV spectrum on the left. In other words, short wavelength, high energy, all the way up to long wavelength, low energy uh, electromagnetic radiation. And then we, uh, we can see where exactly all these different fluorophores fall on that spectrum. In ophthalmology, there's very few so far that we use in clinical practice that are particularly interesting to us. We have fluorescein, we've heard about that today in at least one talk. We've heard about ICG. I think we've heard about ICG, but regardless, we use them both a lot in ophthalmology to look at the quality of blood flow in the retina, see how well the blood vessels are working and allowing these dyes to flow through them when we take these photographs. Another one that's particularly important is lipofusion. That's what Dr. Schwartz talked about this morning is accumulating in the RPE cells. And so this is a, a molecule that's created by the retina as part of normal phototransduction, and it accumulates in RPE cells and it glows really well in, in the dark. And so these photographs that I've shown you of this night light, re, nightlife retina, the retina glowing in the dark, those, that's lipofusion glowing. There's some other things. You've maybe heard of tryptophan and tyrosine and phenylalanine, which are amino acids which are critical for life and uh, make up proteins. And they glow in the dark too at very short wavelengths. So you, uh, they, d they don't glow very brightly in the dark and they glow at very short wavelengths. But there's one here that we're gonna focus on in particular, NADH. I'm sure we've all heard about NADH at some, at some point. It's critical for creating energy in cells. It's an essential component of metabolism. And so we've seen some nice talks today about mitochondria and talking about how mitochondria generate energy by passing different um, uh, molecules and protons and oxygen between elements in the mitochondria to create energy. And so NADH is a critical element in that. So if we look at just NADH, if we shine 350 nanometer light, very short wavelength light on NADH, we can excite it, we can cause it to glow in the dark. And when it glows, it glows at about 460 to 470 nanometers. So you can stimulate NADH to become a glow in the dark molecule with this short wavelength light. Short wavelength light 
is typically more blue. However, with, with the eye, it's got a great filter to protect the retina from damaging short wavelength energy. The cornea, the aqueous fluid, and the lens all block shorter wavelengths. And what this red line over here shows us is the amount of transmission of each of these wavelengths through the eye. Everything to the right of the, of the red line gets into the eye. That gets back to the retina and can stimulate vision in the visible spectrum, or it can get to the, the retina in the infrared spectrum without stimulating vision. But everything to the left of this red line does not enter the eye. It gets blocked by the cornea, aqueous, or lens. So the question then is, how can we stimulate NADH if the light that's necessary to stimulate it can't get into the eye? Well, there's a little trick, and we'll sh I'll show you something called two-photon microscopy, which is a way of dividing the energy between two laser sources at twice the wavelength, essentially, to stimulate it from the other side. So a, long a longer wavelength light with two laser sources to stimulate fluorescence and be able to create this fluorescent NADH. So we've seen the layers of the retina. There's the inner retina and the outer retina in blue and green here, respectively. We can zoom in on those and we can see that the, the layered cells within the retina with the blood vessels on, on, on the top and on the bottom and the RPE cells, which we've heard about today. The photoreceptors, which turn light into electricity and of course the interneurons and the ganglion cells, which connect the photoreceptors back to the brain. We get rid of all of this other stuff and we have just the neurosensory retina. And if I take that neurosensory retina and I roll it up into a little ball, that's a retinal organoid. And the retinal organoid is basically a piece of retina floating in a dish that we can grow. We've heard a little bit about stem cell biology, retinal progenitor cells today. And one other thing that you can do with stem cells is that you can force them down a path to differentiate into these retinal organoids. You can use embryonic stem cells or you can take inducible pluripotent stem cells. In other words, you can take skin or blood from a mature animal, a human for example, and you can turn it into something that can behave like a stem cell. And you can create these retinal organoids that develop over time. And so we see a day one organoid here as it matures to a day three and a day 27 organoid. And you can have these balls of retina floating in a dish and maturing over time. And they mature in a very much similar time course to the way that retinas develop in utero. And that same, the same thing is true for a mouse organoid. A mouse organoid develops much more quickly because the uh, in uterine development of, of mice is much faster than humans. So these balls of retina that float around in a petri dish can work as nice model systems for disease, and they can also be used as tissue engineering or tissue replacement constructs, replacing cells that might have been lost in disease. This whole field of retinal organoid biology has really exploded over the last 10 to 12 years, and the NEI has placed a lot of emphasis on trying to fund kind of, kind of crazy, audacious, or, uh, or um, these things called retinal organoid challenges where they're willing to pour millions of dollars into trying to develop these tissues in vitro so that we can study model systems of the retina without having to go into the human eye. And so this is one of the, uh, the first examples showing this layered structure on the surface of a retinal organoid with photoreceptors on the surface of the organoid stained in green. Synaptic connections can also form between the neurons in these organoids and so they, these little yellow spots are synaptic connections on a, on a neuron. Similarly, electron microscopy can show the disks on the outer surface of these organoids, which is where light is transduced. And similarly, electrophysiology can be demonstrated from the uh, cells in the organoids. And people are even going as far now to uh, inject them into the subretinal space, and I'll talk some more about some of the work that's being done here. So here's some work that I started, uh, I think must have been three years ago now. Cosimo Arnasano uh, is here today. Scott Frazier is here as well, our final speaker for the day. I was working with him at USC, and it was a confluence of, of fortune. Um, finishing my residency, I uh, met a group at, at Children's Hospital Los Angeles who also developed retinal organoids, and uh, we all connected to each other, and we uh, started to investigate these organoids. We used many of the techniques of the second to last speaker today to investigate these organoids, Enrico Catan. But so one of the things you can look here is these organoids from 46 days in culture, as they mature to 151 days, five, six months of culture, these balls of retina floating around like a retinal detachment in culture, um, we can see that there's a, a fair bit of heterogeneity in the structure of these organoids. They can be multilobulated. Sometimes they can be round. Um, but we can see with, a, with light microscopy how these retinal organoids change over time. And if we perform standard hematoxylin and eosin staining, we can see that these organoids go from a single lamellar 
uh, structure in their early f phase to a multi-layered structure with a definitive outer layer here, a middle layer, and some disorganization to the inner layer. Similar and reminiscent to what we see in mature retina. We can perform immunofluorescent staining of these organoids and see over time how um, different cell populations arrange themselves in the organoids. And here we have what are presumed to be photoreceptors on the outer surface of the organoids, standing in green. I'm just going to focus on that because that, that's uh, relevant to some of the other uh, results that I'll show you shortly. But we, we can see that, that uh, these organoids, as they get out to about five months in age, they have photoreceptors that develop on their outer surface. Like any self-respecting retinal specialist, we can put an OCT in front of the organoid and try to take a photograph with OCT as well. And so what we see here is, remember what the normal retina looks like on OCT with multiple layers where the nuclear or cell body layers are hyper-reflective or dark. So these dark layers in the retina are all nuclear layers. In the mature organoid here at about five months, you can see this dark layer at the surface of the organoid. And that corresponds to what we've seen in standard histology, that there is a defined uh, surface layer. And that uh, correlates also with where the photoreceptors are found. Any physician who's ever spent any time in an emergency room knows that everything needs a CAT scan, and so these organoids also needed a CAT scan. And you can see over time that uh, the, the, st the structures of these organoids, although we can't really resolve too much uh, detail about the uh, layered structure of the organoids, we get a little bit more information about the inner architecture of these organoids. But it doesn't reveal too much. So now is uh, the elegant introduction, I hope it's elegant, I hope it, I can do you service, um, as to the work that uh, was pioneered here by Enrico Gratton and, and uh, is performed by the, the strength of, of biophotonics in Southern California with Enrico and Scott, uh, who, who are our next two speakers. Fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy is this special technique where we can take two lasers and we can shine a light onto a very specific point in space. When I'm saying shining a light, I'm saying we have a nanoscopic uh, coincidence of these two lasers, subcellular localization. And what those two, uh, two beams of light do is they stimulate autofluorescence. And then light is emitted. And so we can capture all the light from every single point in space. And if you take these two beams and you scan them across the, uh, the retinal organoid, you can reconstruct an autofluorescent image. And actually, the surface of the organoid here has got a, a, a lot of autofluorescence. And then it's hard to appreciate, you'll see better in some later uh, slides, that there is a d dark band of, uh, of autofluorescence, and that corresponds to where the nuclei are. So this is the glow in the dark. This is the, the, cat, the, the galaxy in the sky. But really looking at, at, at what information is encoded in that glowing light is where the elegance of this technique ar arises. We can look at how the light turns on. It glows, and then it slowly turns off. And so it, the light turns on, and it's got a slow decay until it turns off. And performing a Fourier transform, uh, which I won't get into discussing it here, but it's a technique to mathematically describe this decay of light from a single point in space. We can start to look at individual components of that decay equation. And using the phaser approach, these, this, this little bit of autofluorescence that came out of this organoid can be plotted in two-dimensional space. And we can know that NADH has got two different forms. Some of it's floating around freely in the cytoplasm. Some of it's floating, uh, is, it, is associated with proteins. And we know that the lifetime of NADH changes. This decay profile becomes shorter or longer depending on whether it's associated with other proteins. And so we know that in this two-dimensional space, this little region over here is free NADH, and this area over here is bound NADH. And so that should be reminiscent of oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis. So we can artificially create a metabolic spectrum where we color code uh, individual pixels that, have, that are associated with this part of the two-dimensional plot to be yellow or green, and this part of the plot to be red. And we can artificially color this organoid and see that there's a glycolytic surface and a more oxidative core. So as we use this, the, the, this is the analogy for the child's bedroom of extracting information out of glowing lights. So as, uh, when we look at the, maturing, the, the maturation of these organoids, we can see uh, these dark spots being the nuclei and surrounded by a lot of uh, autofluorescence. And over time, you can see a structural change without touching the organoid. 
Immunofluorescence in histology requires sacrificing the organoid, cutting it into pieces, and that organoid is over, but it does give you information that way. This technique is literally like the tricorder from Star Trek, where you just wave a light source over, over some tissue and you get a diagnosis in a sense. And so what we see is a change in the metabolic signature as these organoids mature. The surface of the organoids are highly glycolytic. You may recall from the previous slides that that's where the photoreceptors are. From prior studies where retina has been explanted from animals and then very finely sectioned at the micron level, we know that the photoreceptors are glycolytically active. So now without touching organoids and knowing that where photoreceptors are, we can confirm that there is glycolysis effect occurring at the surface of the retinal organoid. Another approach is called hyperspectral imaging. It's very similar. We use two laser beams to cause the thing to glow, and then we look at every single pixel in space and look at the rainbow. So there's actually color information encoded in that light as well. And we can divide that color, the, the, the colors into different uh, channels, so 32 different channels, and then perform a similar approach using phaser analysis, again, developed between the two groups here in USC, to look at where are retinol and retinoic acid located. So again, not, touching, not even touching the tissue, just shining light on it and letting it glow and tell us where are subcellular constituents within the cells. And so we can actually plot out where are retinol and retinoic acid. So if we look at these organoids as they mature over time, again, you can see the structural changes over time as they mature. We can look at free NADH. The signal's not quite as strong from hyperspectral imaging, but the most important thing to look at uh, and the most interesting uh, thing to look at is the distribution of retinol and retinoic acid being concentrated in the same location as where photoreceptors are located. And there's processing of retinol and retinoic acid also by the middle retina, so there's concentration of, uh, of these two um, constituents in places where we might suspect that they should be found. So Scott Fraser coined the, the, the term uh, a retinoid Rosetta Stone, which is basically a, a series of imaging modalities applied to these retinal organoids to kind of describe the language of looking at, at organoids with light. And so these are all the different techniques that we use to look at the retinal organoids. So at this point, uh, this work is, is kind of blossoming into a, a variety of different directions. Here at UCI, we have Magdalene Seiler, who's here today as well, and, and Bryce McClelland, who's, uh, who works with her in her lab. They are the local retinal organoid biologists. And Carl Whelan down at UCSD is another local retinal org organoid biologist. Um, who, uh, and, and they both have different research programs uh, directed at different endpoints. And I'll talk, mention that briefly in a few moments. We have a, an amazing uh, group of imaging experts. Bruce Tromberg, who's not here today, but Enrica, our next speaker. Mimo, up at USC, and also Scott Frazier, um, who uh, really make Southern California specifically use, um, uh, unique. Uh, because not every place in the world has the microscopes that, that are available here or the techniques to analyze data uh, in biological specimens. And not only the eye, in every single biological specimen that you can imagine. And finally, uh, Bill Tang and I, um, my, my graduate studies were in microfluidics and biomems. That's actually where what I was trained in. I'm not a biophotonicist, although I hope to become one. Um, we work in, Bill Tang and I work in, in microfluidics, which is basically uh, creating laboratory tests on a chip-based platform where you can perform any, any laboratory test on a disposable chip and control parameters inside those microfluidic microplumbing channels very precisely. And so our goal is to create a, a, a bioreactor for growing retinal organoids to control the environment very specifically and precisely. So we're looking at structure, function, and uh, different disease states hopefully one day in this kind of integrated approach. Um, so organoid manufacturing, as I mentioned previously, is a very heterogeneous process. Being able to reliably and reproducibly create this tissue that we want to study in science or maybe even use as a tissue replacement therapy requires reproducibility and quality control. So with Bill Tang uh, and his expertise in, in bioreactors, which here's an example of a bioreactor he created for a different purpose, you can see these uh, tubes coming in and feeding this very small reaction chamber that's probably on the order of a few millimeters in size. Um, you, can, you can create a diffusion uh, environment rather than s cells floating in a petri dish and being sloshed around. You can have complete diffusion and stasis of the fluid while still supplying nutrients and removing toxins and metabolic end products. <coughs> 
So we can see here a, uh, some cells that were introduced into a central chamber in the bioreactor, and over time the cells proliferate while they're being perfused. Uh, and, and this is our goal is to recapitulate some uh, a similar system for retinal organoids and use that system as a basic science platform for understanding uh, retinal biology in vitro. So we saw some pictures earlier of macular degeneration where we see a complete absence of the foundation, the RPE, as well as the photoreceptors. And so in patients who have this condition, they've lost all of their vision. And so a technique to replace the cellular function or replace the cells uh, is highly desirable in people who have irreversibly lost their vision. And so the idea here is, would be to take a, a retinal organoid, cut it into a sheet, and then inject it underneath the retina. And so Magdalene Seiler and her team here have done exactly that in uh, rats that have a degenerative model of, of, um, of vision loss. And so here's an example of an OCT image of a retinal organoid that has been in introduced to the subretinal space of a rat. And that's uh, some of the ongoing work here as well. So finally, imaging, being able to look at tissues in vitro and have high resolution and high structural and high functional um, informational yield is desirable. But ultimately, one day, we'd like to be able to look inside our patient's eyes with light and be able to look at with autofluorescence and also maybe be able to start to see some structure and functional information as well that tell us what is the status of a disease process, what is the diagnosis of a disease process, and how can we better improve therapies and management for our patients. A lot of people have uh, put some time and effort into what I've shown you today, and they're listed here. And uh, before we move on to the next speakers, I'll take any questions if there are any. Right, there are RPE cells that develop uh, in the course of retinal organoid development. They don't d develop in a nice uh, controlled way. They kind of create lobules off to the side. And so um, when Magdalene introduces these into subretinal space, she takes particular care to remove the RPE because they can form tumors when they're introduced into the into subretinal space. So RPE can be generated in a similar fashion, um, but it's not nearly as controlled or predictable as uh, the self-assembly of the organoid itself. Um, humans have got three different cone opsins. Uh, Dr. Jameson does research in color vision and um, is trying to understand how we can detect and measure uh, a fourth cone opsin, a fourth wavelength of light. And so uh, these organoids can be generated from any, any animal in principle. And uh, Carl Whelan has demonstrated cone opsins. Um, actually, I think they were of the uh, L and M variety. I'm not sure if S opsin was, was available um, or was detected uh, in his work, but um, in principle, yes, you should be able to get to that point eventually. Oh, very nice. Yeah, so that's a f fantastic question. Actually, it probably hails more to Magdalene's area of expertise because she has transplanted these organoids as well as fetal retina um, into, into animals. And what, what does happen is that synaptic connections do occur uh, between the transplanted tissue and the host. Um, you know, the question is, can connections be made all the way through the retina, through the interneurons, horizontal amacrine bipolars uh, and Mueller cells to the ganglion cells? Um, there's a body of, of work that we're hoping to, uh, to begin very soon where we compare uh, ages of organoids and transplantation and also uh, dissociated cells from organoids um, to see if, if there is a way that we can um, kind of optimize that milieu uh, for transplantation. So, so two photon microscopy has not been done in any living animal yet. Um, so this is what I've shown, I believe, is the only two-photon microscopy of retinal tissue. Um, there is a, an adapted Heidelberg spectralis device uh, that has been circulating around the country and the world. It's only maybe two or three of them. Very few people have had access to them. But they uh, use single photon excitation in the, uh, in the spectrum. I think it's probably around 400 nanometers or maybe a little bit longer um, to stimulate autofluorescence and then look at lifetime. Um, but it's not uh, two-photon excitation. Now, when we talk about two-photon microscopy, it's a really broad set of uh, 
microscopy techniques that encompass things like FLIM and hyperspectral imaging, which I showed today. But with these uh, microscope systems, there are tunable lasers where you can vary the wavelength. And I think most typically, and, and I think it's always within the infrared spectrum uh, that, that the excitation occurs with multi-photon, because the benefit is uh, that a longer wavelength is less damaging than a shorter wavelength. And so the idea is you can use less energy and create less damage to the tissue um, in situ. Thank you.